I'm here this morning with Viv Ansel. Viv is a retired Deputy General Manager of Bank of New Zealand who served in the Second World War. Where were you during the Second World War? Well, I volunteered for overseas service as soon as I turned 21, and that was in November 1940. Um, some friends of mine whom I'd been with in the territorials uh, up until then had already gone off to the Middle East because they were a bit older than I was. I was in touch with them all the time and I said, I'm coming to join you as soon as I'm able to. Um, when I joined the army, they were going to put me in the pay corps because of my job, my civilian job. And I said, no, no, no. I want to be in the artillery because I've got friends in the Middle East who are in artillery and I want to join them. So they put me in the artillery. Um, I first reported to Papakura camp in April 1941. Uh, we trained on old 18-pounder guns from the First World War, because that was the best they had. We had to pull them up on locks and tackles onto the top of flat-top trucks, and then, because they didn't have any, anything better in the way of getting them around. In, it was in April, that they said, now you're ready for overseas service. I think we'd had about six weeks training at that stage. We were on a train going up to Auckland to catch a ship. As we went along Key Street, they said, pull the blinds down. We can't allow people to see that there are troops on the train. And we pulled up in the at the wharf, and to our amazement, there, there was the old mama wire that used to trade between uh, Australia and New Zealand and North America. We thought, surely we're not going to be able to do a thing like this. She'd been made an armed merchantman. And it was only after we got aboard the ship, and we seemed to be going in the opposite direction, that we where we thought we would be going, we found we were going to Fiji to replace a garrison that had been there for six months and uh, then come back and go to the Middle East. That's what, that's what was happening to that earlier garrison. We said, oh, well, I suppose it's not fair. That's fair enough. They asked us to mount our old 18 pounders on the deck of the ship in case it was attacked from the air. They were bad enough on the ground, but to put them on the steel ship, the, the only gun on the ship was a six inch thing that went out the front somewhere. <laughs> and we had these old guns on, on, on the deck. And we were in a camp called Salmon Buller for a long time while we trained, had a lot of training there. And then at the crucial time when we thought we'd be coming back to New Zealand, Japan or something like that, it put a different complexion on the whole thing. We were then, 14 of us were rushed around to the other side of the island where our job became um, protecting the Nandi Airport, which was in the course of construction. And so that's where, and, or at the, at the same time, new guns were brought in for us. Um, 4.5 inch houses, which at least had rubber tyres and, uh, and vehicles to pull them around, but they were still First World War ones. Anyhow, we trained with them, and halfway through uh, our training, 
they said we would have a, a live shoot uh, out into the bay where the Japanese were likely to land if they were coming. And, and this live shoot also um, had these six, uh, six inch guns that were behind us in it too. Well, in the middle of this live shoot, a shell landed in the middle of the runway. The worst possible place for it to be. Uh, of course, there was a huge argument about whose guns it did it, ours or theirs. Well, in the end, some of our officers went down and had a look at the hole in the crater, the crater and they found it a part of a, a six-inch shell, so that exonerated us. Did you manage to catch up with your friends in the Middle East? No, I didn't. Um, we were brought back to New Zealand. The Americans had arrived in Fiji in numbers and miles of equipment, so we were sent back to New Zealand. Um, we then went into another camp. We thought we were going to Papakura again, but no, we went to another camp. And uh, from there, it was decided to form the third division, which was to operate in, in the Pacific, mm -hmm. rather than going to the Middle East. Um, the third division went to New Caledonia on a, a ship called the West Point which formerly had been America's uh, biggest and loveliest cruise ship. Uh, of course, a, a luxury liner. Not when we were on it. There were 6,000 trips on it. And we, we got to New York. Uh, we trained there for months and months. And then it was decided to take us into the forward areas, which were the Solomon Islands at that time. We went to the Solomon Islands on a ship called the President Adams, and it was his 13th trip uh, between New Caledonia and the Solomon Islands. We thought, well, that's not very good for a start. We, we unloaded the ship uh, in the New Hebrides, which are now Vanuatu, and, and did a complete exercise there. Unloaded the ship, went ashore, took gun pits and all that sort of thing, and then had to fill them all in and get back on the ship. But when we got to Guadalcanal, there were 14 ships uh, standing around while we unloaded the house ship. There were two other ships as well with other units on them. 14 American uh, uh, destroyers and that sort of thing while we unloaded the ships. So the Americans had been through Guadalcanal in a tremendous battle. Um, and we were just to follow up and clean up there while they went further forward. A rather funny thing happened. Almost the day we got there, we had some time off, so we went to. We were wandering around having a look at the place, and there was, we came across a river which we later found out was an Italian river. And we could see on the other side of the river a, a Japanese plane that had been brought down. And everybody in those days was looking after perp, perspex because our people could make all sorts of things out of it. So we thought, let's go over and have a look at this plane. There was one man who couldn't swim. So we got a log and uh, we said, you hang on to that and we'll drag you over. Which we did. And when we got to the plane, we found that it, uh, all the perspectives had been taken. Someone had been there ahead of us. But alongside of it, there was a huge mount of sand, which was Japanese bodies, which the Americans had 
bulldozes it into a great heap of sand. And that's the only way they could bury them. The smell was putrid. And we got back anyhow, the other side. The next day, on the notice board of our unit, was a sign saying troops were forbidden to go across the Metallica River because of crocodiles or into the mouth of the river because of sharks. We'd been crossing back at the mouth, so, so we were lucky. That's a fantastic story. Is there anything else, uh, any other special memory you have of your time in the war that you would like to share with us? Well, we went from Grand Canal to a, another island called Vela Lavella. These islands had been cleaned out by the Americans, uh, but we had to do the clean up. There were still a few Japs around. Uh, I was in artillery, so I, I never got near the front lines, the infantry were out there, but we were always there in case they needed fire brought to there to make their life easy. Uh, and then from there we went to an island that was north of the Solomons. The purpose of going to that island was to allow the Americans to get near a huge Japanese naval base on an island called Truck, T-A-U-K. We hadn't been able to get near it. But they came to Lissom Island to be able to create an airport from which they could fly to track. Well, if I want to say something about the day we landed on this island. We were on a ship called, we called it an LST, Landing Ship Tanks. The first vehicle offered was a bulldozer from the construction battalion usually called the CB, the S E A B E S. It was first off with its uh, uh, blade up to protect the driver and then when he got to the beach he lowered the blade and scooped out a Japanese air, um, machine gun post that had been firing at the ship. So they came from a pretty sticky here. We then were able to take our guns ashore and get them into posts where we could fire if necessary. Because of course in the jungle, uh, we didn't see anything we were firing at because of the jungle. We had to dig our guns into coral unyielding coral, but then get down below um, land level. And then camouflage the guns and then cut trees so that their shells could have a lack of fire to where they had to go. Now, the Americans had an airfield going within days. They were wonderful with their construction outfits. Then in came Liberator, liberator bombers, huge things, that were going to fly and bomb the truck. Well, we watched the first truck, the first uh, liberator go out, and we waited with bated breath for it to come back and hear about bombing the truck. Unfortunately, navigation wasn't a strength with the uh, Americans, uh, and they couldn't find track, so they dropped their bombs in the sea. But the next time they went out, they did find track, but they were beaten up so badly by Japanese fighters that they only limped back, crash landed, and killed all the men of war. Now that's where the New Zealanders were asked to take part in a funeral ceremony. The island was so low that the, 
water was just brackish water um, immediately under the surface. So you could dig holes as fast as you like, but there's a fill up as fast as you dug them. So as the vehicle arrived with these bodies in, in white bloodstained shrouds, the yeah, guys were bailing, 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 and would allow the bodies to be put down into the graves. And the Americans didn't like that. But they did find some higher ground where it would be more appropriate to bury them. So they decided to dig up those bodies and take them to higher ground. We were again called upon, and I was the chart, sergeant in charge of the group, to exhume these bodies, put them in boxes, where they were taken away. That was an unpleasant job. We, the second time when we went to dig them up, um, we had to wear gas masks. So, so this is really about the. Um, uh, that's a lovely, a lovely story in the sense of the respect that you were trying to pay for fallen comrades. Um, how does that make today special for you, and the rededication of these plaques here at Harbour Keys? I thought it was very special today. Uh, the presence of the military, uh, the bugle corps, uh, the RSA, and so many PNZ staff who probably never heard very much about the war anyhow. And of course, these plaques, they represent the past and the people in the PNZ all those years ago. I found that very touching. Uh, we, uh, when we came back to New Zealand, the idea was then to go to the Middle East and Italy by then. Unfortunately, we all had to go through a medical board and I was told that <coughs> I didn't pass the medical board because of eyesight of all things. I'd been a gun layer for a long time before I had my own gun, and eyesight was very important. But anyhow, they, they said you should never have been fast in the first place. <laughs> but uh, anyhow, that's, uh, that's the way it ended. And then it was then that I was able to go back to the BNZ. <laughs>